Welcome, everyone. This is the Jenkins User Experience Special Interest Group. It's the 21st of June, uh, 2023. Thanks for being here. I'll update the attendee list a little later here. Topics that I've got on the, on the list for today, what's happened recently in UI improvements as one topic, and then a reminder for the next LTS baseline, a temporary expansion of the security audits. This one, Vadak Folonie will, will lead the discussion on. And then we've got, in addition, a topic on keyboard usability from Christina Pizzagalli. And I've got a closing topic on end of life for operating systems. Any other topics that need to go on the agenda for today? Okay, then let's get started. So on the recent UI improvements, uh, thanks to the work of Tim Jacome and Basil Crow, prototype JS removal has started and is making great progress. Thanks very, very much. Jenkins Core has had its uses of prototype already removed. And since Jenkins 2.406, the usage from Core of prototype is gone. We continue to ship it so that we retain compatibility, but the usages in core are gone so that we can find it. And there is now a, a, an experimental feature that you can disable the use of prototype to see what happens. Thanks to Basel for keeping this plugins tracking sheet up to date. We're seeing good progress there as, as we get releases of plugins. There are some, you can see the, the sort of orange colored bars have a pull request and need to be released, needs to be merged and released. The red don't have a pull request. So we're welcoming contributions from the community and others to help with the transition off of Prototype JS. Any questions on Prototype JS? Okay, so next topic on my list then was we've got a new UI, new feature coming in the UI from Marcus Winter of SAP. He's proposed to use a modal dialogue inside the web pages for the delete dialogue. Uh, nice modernization, really good feel. It's been through the security review, it's been through various use reviews, so it should be arriving pretty soon. Any questions or concerns there? Okay, next topic then was UI improvement pull requests from Jan Farachik. And here there are several in flight that need, that are either ready to merge or need review and further discussion. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any of these that I feel like I need to highlight specifically over the other, just that we've got these ongoing pull requests that, that are looking for comments, reviews, and getting ready to merge. Then there are some that I'd say have more, more discussion going on where it's proposed to change Manage Jenkins to be settings. And there's discussion there. It's recent discussion happening in the last few days. Um, good discussion, but it needs to continue. Likewise, this change of the structure of the the jelly files to better represent things has good discussion happening between Jan and 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 Jesse Glick and others. Any questions or concerns on any of those? Okay, then the last item for me on the current current UI progress was we've got work from Marcus Winter of SAP on three additional pull requests that are sort of quiet right now and might benefit by some extra attention to bring them back to life. Okay, any other items on specific UI improvements? Yeah, I, did, I did some experiments with the CSS compilation and uh, I, found, I found that I was able to use uh, I was able to use uh, some transpiler to compile newer newer CSS syntax into a form that could still be understood by HTML unit. And I think that could be a viable approach for us to continue to modernize the 
CSS that we use without breaking our existing unit tests that rely on HTML unit, which can't parse a lot of the newer syntax. So I have one pull request that demonstrates that for the media feature range notation. But in general, I think that's an approach that we could use for other CSS features in the future. Um, and we already have uh, the Babel JavaScript transpiler doing the same thing for JavaScript. So this approach should be the same thing, but for our style sheets. Thank you. Okay, so so Basel, in terms of what that really means is as a developer, I can write CSS that's modern and the transpiler will convert it into a form that is understood by HTML unit three, by the old JavaScript interpreter that's that's understood by HTML unit three. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, I compared the generated CSS from my change before and after, and it was exactly the same. Um, even though uh, the code that was checked into Git was the newer syntax. So it, it transpiled to the exact same version as, it, as what we currently have checked into Git. Excellent. Now, is there is there more review needed there, or is it just that we need to we need to get the review and then get it merged? What What do you feel like? Yeah, I have two step? pull requests. Uh, I think one of them has one approval so far. Um, the other one is for. So I, I tried to use this transpilation option for the has pseudo notation, and it did not work for that because has is more complicated and cannot be transpiled into older CSS uh, without some JavaScript as well. So the, the polyfill for the has feature is more complicated. It, it requires both CSS and JavaScript to run in browsers that don't support has. And the JavaScript part of this polyfill didn't work in HTML unit either, which is just really, it's really depressing because you're trying to you're trying to use a polyfill which is ostensibly designed to support older browsers. The older browser doesn't even support the polyfill. <laughs> so, um, but I think this is more of an exception. Uh, I, I don't think. I, th I think in the common case, we should be able to transpile most things if they aren't complicated like this, because most of the polyfills that I saw, the vast majority of them were pure CSS, didn't need any um, any JavaScript. So, uh, so just because I wasn't able to use the transpile approach in the case of has doesn't mean that we can't use it in general. Um, but getting rid of the has pseudo notation at least makes our logs clean because our logs are full of HTML unit not understanding this has uh, mm. notation, uh, which is just distracting when you're running other tests. So, so, so basically, my first pull request gets simplifies the has um, the has notation, and my my second one introduces the transpiler. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any questions from others to Basel on CSS transpilation, on transpiling with CSS? Rob's related to that. Have you tried with some less or SCSS situation as well there, or just with pure CSS that is a model? This is um, this is already using SCSS. Uh, in fact, that the technology that I'm using is um, is. Uh, uh, it's a preset environment for our, our for our CSS um, a building tool. I forget what it's called now. Uh, post CSS, but yeah. So we we're already using SCSS, and the the way that this technology works, I thought that I thought that we would be directly compiling SCSS into CSS, but that's not how it works. It it compiles. SCSS into some intermediary representation that's unique to post CSS. And then post CSS has a, a generic uh, a generic mechanism for compiling 
its intermediary representation into CSS. So uh, essentially, SCSS and less and many others are just front ends to this post CSS subsystem, um, which, I, which was surprising to me, but that's how it works. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right, next next topic then was the, just a reminder from me that as a reminder, our next LTS baseline will be chosen in three weeks, July the 12th. So the, the weekly releases, we, we always care about weekly release stability, but be mindful that we're up, upcoming on the next LTS baseline selection. So let's do a good job. That likely means 2.414 or 2.413 will be the chosen baseline if our past patterns hold. Any questions on LTS baseline selection? Okay, Vadek, you want to take this next topic? Yep. So it's a pretty long topic. If you want to move to another one before, no worries from my side. Well, up to you. I think I need at least uh, perhaps a 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the discussion around that. Yeah, and I, I was thinking, well, we could, we could, Christina, if you're not especially interested in the security audit, we could bring secure, Christina's earlier, if, if that would be easier for you, Christina, or if you intend to be with us the whole time, we'll just put you where, where you are on the agenda now. Wherever you'd like it, would like. So then, given the time variable of this one, I'd like to go ahead with this one, Vadek, if that's okay. Perfect. No problem. That line is not critical that we cover it this week. It's just a continuation of what we've already discussed. So, so to provide you some context related to the topic there, you can open the reference that you have uh, like three or four lines after. It's just an advisory that we published some uh, days ago related to uh, an issue that was in Jenkins for perhaps seven years or eight years, something like this. So that vulnerability was detected recently by the security team. I think it was one month ago, something like this. And what was uh, interesting to see with that one, it was corrected as a side effect of something else. And when you know that it was detected one month ago, but was present for seven years, and it was detected and corrected in the approximately two weeks or this kind of thing, that's pretty uh, interesting. What is also uh, interesting there is that we are usually doing some audits on the web UI, the pure UI related uh, pull request. That was something we put in place some, um, not weeks, but month ago, and that reduced drastically the number of vulnerability that were introduced recently in Jenkins. By recently, I mean like uh, less than one year ago, because we have some vulnerability that we are still finding in the code that are coming from 10 years ago and this kind of thing. It's just a matter of finding them at some point. And with the audit that we are doing, it was reducing drastically the number of them that were recent. So if you come back to the previous uh, tab, please, Mark. Thank you. So uh, what is interesting there is that that pull request was not UI related. It was in JavaScript with some Jelly aspect. I don't remember exactly, but it's uh, JavaScript and Jelly. But these things were not covered by the initial scope of the, the requirement for the audit in the past because they are not touching the UI, meaning it's not visible for the user. That was really the goal of the first um, policy or instance there. So at this point, that's just for the context, I want to just raise a bit the awareness about the cost of the security release, because that's something that could be oversight by people that are not directly working within that process. So I try to keep it simple there. Uh, I discuss with Basil about uh, the extended list of things we are doing. Uh, you, can feel, you can see that list is already reduced by at least a factor of two, I think. So, we have a lot of costs in terms of time, in terms of uh, time frame as well, in terms of constraints. If we correct something within the pull request, it's fairly easy. It's a matter of perhaps one day maximum the time to do some ping pong discussion and this kind of thing. But if we wait for it to be released and part of a version of Jenkins, it's at least 20, uh, 20 times the cost just for the security team. Now, it's also something to consider. It's what is outside of the security team. I'm mentioning that at the end. 
So for the security team, the preparation is time consuming because we have to do some coordination between what we have ourselves in the private version and what is in the public version. All the backport we have to provide for the weekly and the LTS, in addition, the release lead for the next LTS version will provide some backports. So these backports have to be integrated with our fix, ensuring that the fix is still fixing the vulnerability. And also the weekly is sometimes something that is changing quickly, depending on the time. So we have to integrate that as well inside our fix and still ensuring it's fixing the vulnerability. So due to that, we have to prepare some additional data. So the advisory per se, so the content, the description that you are seeing at the end, but also the upgrade guide, the change log, and all the merge information that we are using to do the different merge of the pull request correctly in the good order while ensuring everything is compiling correctly. That's for the security aspect of the security team. What is also invisible most of the time for the contributor is the impact for the user of Jenkins. If you are running a version of Jenkins that has an open vulnerability, meaning that we have published an advisory, your version become vulnerable, openly vulnerable. It was already, but now everybody knows about that. And with the information, some companies ask to provide a quick update. So urgent update and this kind of thing, which is disturbing their regular day-to-day -day work in a sense. So we try to reduce the number of, of security release to approximately one per month to reduce a bit the alert fatigue. To not have one release every day or every week, it will be a pain for everyone. And also, compared to a non-security LTS, if you don't want to adopt a new version of LTS, it's up to you. You do, don't want the new feature and this kind of thing, that's fine. But when it's for security, it's expected that you adopt it because it will have an impact on your instance or potentially depending on the vulnerability of course. And last point, the security scanners, they are very close friends in the sense that they are reporting a lot of CVEs every time that are not always very interesting, but it's just a noise that we are adding to the top of all these kind of things. So all the information there is not to say that we have to split the bill or this kind of thing. It's something that we are paying in the security team. It's just to make other people aware about the incurred cost of that. That is not just, oh, you have to correct the thing. It's a one line thing, so you can do it quickly. Yes, the fix itself is simple. Usually it's 95% of the thing, it's outside of the pull request per se, the fix. So perhaps any question related to the cost there? And so, so have you considered ways to, are there any ways that we could spread those costs or is the reality most of them have to be because of the confidential nature, they have to happen inside the security team, no matter what? We can expand the people working within this fix. It's more a matter of time and will from people. The security team is open. If you want to contribute, to participate in this kind of thing, what we, what we usually require is that the people inside the team are active in the team because they have access to a lot of confidential information. If they are part of the team once per year, it could be problematic in terms of security, confidentiality, and so on. Providing the fix could be a way to participate in the effort, but as I mentioned, it's 5% of the cost. Right. So it's a participation for sure. Uh, typically, the release lead, and I'm seeing in that uh, meeting already some previous release lead, they are participating by the coordination and this kind of thing. So that's also part of the thing there. Well, I liked you. your point about requiring people who are on the team to be active within the team. And I think there are other teams in Jenkins where it would be beneficial to have a requirement that people who are on the team are active within the team. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Okay, Vadek, do you want me to go on to the next section then? Yep, thank you for the, the scroll there. So uh, what I'm proposing at this point is that we are expanding the scope of the pull request that require a security review. What is expected at this point is to expand to the Jelly and JavaScript pull request, meaning the thing that could be related to same kind of XSS and other vulnerability. 
I would like to have that uh, expansion to be done for two months and not just indefinite. Even the previous policy is not indefinite in terms of timing. It's just until we are not seeing any vulnerability frequently, I would say. That one, it's more like um, a time box effort to see if there is an interest, if we are finding something. Because if after two months, we have, find, we have found nothing, there is no value to continue that, to, to reduce the pace of the, the development, to slow down the contribution. That's not the goal at all. Also, during that period, if we are finding something, it's a way also to inform the contributor, hey, be careful, that one was dangerous. That one could be also impacting and this kind of thing. That could raise a bit, triggered some discussion related to that. Also, as I'm expanding the scope of that, I don't want just to be annoying and this kind of thing. We are also helping in terms of uh, compensation there in the sense that currently we are looking actively on the open pull request at least once per week. So usually the people in the team are looking at that proactively, but we have one reminder per team per week, sorry. And the idea is to move to at least three times per week, mainly Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this kind of thing. So if nobody was looking at something on Tuesday, on Wednesday, the team will look at the thing, okay, we have to split a bit the different things so that we provide an audit as soon as possible. That could be a way to move forward. Something to keep in mind, most of the pull requests that are not UI related are very simple in terms of audit, meaning that we have seen a lot of such pull requests in the past. Reviewing them could take us between five and 10 minutes, something like that. So mainly, if there is something that is blocked because of us, a single ping could solve the situation in perhaps 20 minutes or half an hour. That's very optimistic, I would say. I would like to see the, the practical effect of that. So, like if, so, yeah. so Vadek, in terms of how would you like that ping? Is there a, an alias or just W. Falonier? What, what's your preference in terms of if we need to ping, how do we ping? Yeah, ideally, the label is enough. The need security review is Oh, enough. good. Okay, add the... Okay, great. And if it's not enough, if we need to have a mention, a ping in the pull request, I think we have created a team that is like security review or something like that. I can provide the, the team name just uh, in two minutes. Also, Another point about the scope, why are we doing that only for JavaScript and Jelly and not for the rest of the pull requests like dependency update, backend correction, uh, modification and so on. It's usually something we have seen. The backend in general in Jenkins is more secure in core and popular plugins. In low popularity plugins, it's also part of the issue, but we are not in that kind of situation. So usually the core maintainer and all the people contributing for the backend know, I will say, 99% of, of the thing related to security, putting the required post, putting the check permission, and this kind of thing. So I have not seen any recent vulnerability introduced because of that. If there were, it's mainly a corner case, very complicated code, and this kind of thing. So from my point of view, there is no real risk with that. But the JavaScript jelly is more easy to put some XSS inside. So that's a bit why I would like to focus on that aspect and not on everything. We have to consider the practical aspect. The team, the, 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 the security team time is limited. We are not infinite number of people there. So we have to focus on the things that matter the most. That's a bit the idea. And related to that, just a quick reminder the team is very happy to be pinged on any pull request, even if it's not JS or Jelly. If you think there is something that could be problematic, if you have a doubt, ping us. It's a lot easier for us to, to spend five minutes, oh, no, no, don't worry, it's a false positive, instead of having to correct something. So typically, I know Alex was pinging us on some of the things, and it was like, oh, no worries. That one is simple, but for us, it's really five minutes. And instead of having something that is very dangerous and is merged, the cost is increased with that. So just a summary about the thing there. We want to have a scope expanded for at least two months. 
at the end of the tumor, I expect it to be completed, to be removed with the, the, the outcome like we have discovered no thinking tumor, there is no interest to, to continue at all. Ideally, we have discovered some things that are interesting and we have mentioned that to the other people so that they can check by themselves. So that for the future, they will be, I would say, aware with code about the different things that are dangerous so that they can ping us more actively without relying on a forced policy like this which is not ideal at all. So I'm done with my uh, all uh, layers and this kind of thing. So please, any question, any concern, any feedback about that? So oh, thank you so much for explaining all of this. And I, I really appreciated learning about this process of, that is followed for each security release. If you want, we can explain a bit the discussion. We can spend hours discussing about the whole process and this kind of thing. But, uh, yeah. So now I know, Alexander, you've been frequently involved in these kind of pull requests. Are there any concerns from you in terms of this, this, extra, this extra step in order to, to keep security costs reasonable? Any, any concerns from you, Alexander? Uh, no, I don't have any concerns. One could possibly argue that it would or could slow down the overall time to get APR delivered, but I don't think the impact is huge on that, given, like Vadek said, the team would review them more than one time a week, and we don't have that many open pull requests needing attention from the security team targeting Jelly or JS components. So I think the impact would be rather marginal, and we would be still able to deliver front-end pull requests in a timely manner. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any yeah. others? Who have... Just, uh, oh, go ahead, Alex, uh, keep in mind that if you are seeing something, tell me, because that's typically something I don't want to slow down the process of others. If we are slowing down by 1%, that's fine. But if it becomes really relevant, uh, we have to discuss, we have to readjust the, the process and this kind of thing. Sorry, Mark. A any other concerns? Any or any concerns from other participants in the call? All right. So then I'm going to go ahead and um, agreed proceed as as proposed. And note, uh, given I've seen no objections, I think we we say yes. The UX SIG says, let's go ahead with this. Vadek, thank you very much for the, the Jenkins security team being willing to do it. And thanks to core reviewers for helping, helping make it successful. Next topic then was improve keyboard usability. Christina, do you want to give us a summary there? And <clears throat> yeah, so um, where it was left, the, the big three blockers had been cleared. Um, the top nav sidebar, the breadcrumbs. Um, so um, in last month's meeting, uh, the ask was that I kind of humanize the breakdown, the audit that had been done, the German language one. So what I've done is created, um, it's about seven, let me see. Here, I'll just open it. Yeah, please. Yeah, there's seven tasks. I figure rather than bombard the board with a bunch of them, um, group them by um, the... Um, so right now we're going to target 2.1, keyboard operation and navigation, and the results um, therein. So some are straightforward, some are broken down a bit more, so it's got clear um, acceptance criteria and suggested fixes. Um, but it's a good starting batch. So if I open one of these, you're saying that I, I oh, okay, there are, there is a description of the issue yeah. and a link back to the Epic so that it's not just experts who could pick this up. No, no, hopefully not. Um, and I assume since I created them, if they get comments, I'll, I'll get those, um, I'll get notified so I can jump in and, and provide further clarification if needed. So in terms of, is this, is this one, we've, sometimes we get questions in the Gitter channels. I'm a new contributor. Um, right. I'd like to help. 
this feels like it's still a little more specialized than a new contributor might be particularly ready to embrace. What's your sense? Is this friendly to a university student or somebody who's I just... Would say, I would say probably not. Okay. All right. Uh, just because it it does affect the core and it's kind of across all... I, I don't know. My gut take would be that ideally it was somebody who understood the the platform. Okay, so so th that thanks thanks for the guidance. That means for for those of us who sort of do advocacy noise out in the I we're I'm not going to tend to use this one, and we'll let this one rather be more handled by people who are already experienced in working in the Jenkins UI. That'd be ideal, yeah. Great. Okay. And most of them are kind of straightforward. They're, you know, mixed up tab indexes, things like that, things that fingers crossed, you know, are not not huge lifts. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from others on on the keyboard usability improvements? Now, I guess this is one, these will probably touch jelly files. Uh, right, because that's commonly where where navigation is set. So Vodex team will then be flagged, but they should, we hope, also be relatively simple reviews because they're not, Christina, the way you described it, they're not huge changes. They shouldn't be, no. Okay, great. Any other questions for Christina? Okay, next topic then was notifying users of operating system end of life. And this is just to share that we've accelerated the visibility uh, of this notification. We added an admin monitor in 2.407 to tell people if they were running an operating system we knew would be end of life in the next six months. And we hope that will help at least some subset of them to get off those those old operating systems. We have an approved exception to the usual LTS policy so that next week when we release 2.401.2, this warning will also appear to LTS users. So that's about eight weeks earlier than we expected. It's not harmful to them. I think it's a reasonable thing to try to warn them earlier that their, their operating system is reaching end of life. Uh, any concerns or comments there? I guess I should note one thing is that I'm dreaming of a future extension where, we're, where we will warn people about container end of life. And container end of life is a very different thing because it's not the operating system. It's the fact that we're no longer going to maintain that container image. Uh, that's not there yet. It needs extensions to the base thing, but we think it's a good thing to tell people you're running a container image we're not going to support after such and such a date. All right, that's all that I had. Anything else that we need to discuss here today?